The balloon, beginning at a point on 14th Street, the exact location of which I cannot reveal, expanded northward all one night while people were sleeping until it reached the park. There I stopped. At dawn, the northernmost edges lay over the plaza. The free-hanging motion was frivolous and gentle. But experiencing a faint irritation at stopping even to protect the trees, and seeing no reason the balloon should not be allowed to expand upward over the parts of the city it was already covering into the airspace to be found there, I asked the engineers to see to it. This expansion took place throughout the morning, a soft, imperceptible sighing of gas through the valves. The balloon then covered 45 blocks north and south and an irregular area east and west, as many as six crosstown blocks on either side of the avenue in some places. That was the situation then. But it's wrong to speak of situations implying sets of circumstances leading to some resolution, some escape of tension. There were no situations, simply the balloon hanging there. Muted, heavy greys and browns for the most part, contrasting with walnut and soft yellows. A deliberate lack of finish, enhanced by skillful installation, gave the surface a rough, forgotten quality. Sliding weights on the inside, carefully adjusted, anchored the great, vary-shaped mass at a number of points. Now we've had a flood of original ideas in all media, works of singular beauty as well as significant milestones in the history of inflation, but at that moment there was only this balloon, concrete, particular, hanging there. There were reactions. Some people found the balloon interesting. As a response, this seemed inadequate to the immensity of the balloon. The suddenness of its appearance over the city, on the other hand, in the absence of hysteria or other societally induced anxiety, it must be judged a calm, mature one. There was a certain amount of initial argumentation about the meaning of the balloon. This subsided because we have now learned not to insist on meanings and they're rarely even looked for now, except in cases involving the simplest, safest phenomena. There was a certain amount of initial argumentation about the meaning of the balloon. This subsided because we've learned not to insist on meanings, and they're rarely even looked for now, except in cases involving the simplest, safest phenomena. It was agreed that since the meaning of the balloon could never be known absolutely, extended discussion was pointless or at least less meaningful than the activities of those who, for example, hung green and blue paper lanterns from the warm gray underside in certain streets, or seized the occasion to write messages on the surface, announcing their availability for the performance of unnatural acts, or the availability of acquaintances. Daring children jumped, especially at those points where the balloon hovered close to a building, so that the gap between balloon and building was a matter of a few inches, or points where the balloon actually made contact, exerting an ever-so-slight pressure against the side of a building, so that balloon and building seemed a unity. The upper surface was so structured that a landscape was presented. Small valleys, as well as slight knolls or mounds, once atop the balloon, a stroll was possible, or even a trip from one place to another. There was pleasure in being able to run down an incline, then up the opposing slope, both gently graded, or in making a leap from one side to the other. Bouncing was possible because of the pneumaticity of the surface, and even falling if that was your wish. That all these varied motions, as well as others, were within one's possibilities in experiencing the upside of the balloon, was extremely exciting for children accustomed to the city's flat, hard skin. But the purpose of the balloon was not to amuse children. To the number of people, children, and adults who took advantage of the opportunities described was not so large as it might have been. A certain timidity, lack of trust in the balloon was seen. There was, furthermore, some hostility, because we'd hidden the pumps which fed helium to the interior and because the surface was so vast that the authorities could not determine the point of entry, that is, the point at which the gas was injected. A degree of frustration was evidenced by those city officers into whose province such manifestations normally fell. 
The apparent purposelessness of the balloon was vexing, as was the fact that it was there at all. Had we painted in great letters, laboratory tests prove or 18% more effective on the sides of the balloon, this difficulty would have been circumvented, but I could not bear to do so. On the whole, these officers were remarkably tolerant, considering the dimensions of the anomaly. This tolerance being the result of first secret tests conducted by night that convinced them that little or nothing could be done in the way of removing or destroying the balloon, and secondly, a public warmth that arose, not uncolored by untouches of the aforementioned hostility toward the balloon from ordinary citizens. As a single balloon must stand for a lifetime of thinking about balloons, so each citizen expressed in the attitude he chose a complex of attitudes. One man might consider that the balloon had to do with the notion sullied, as in the sentence, the big balloon sullied the otherwise clear and radiant Manhattan sky. That is, the balloon was in this man's view an imposture, something inferior to the sky that had formerly been there something interposed between the people and their sky. But in fact, it was January. The sky was dark and ugly. It was not a sky you could look up into, lying on your back in the street with pleasure, unless pleasure for you proceeded from having been threatened, from having been misused. And the underside of the balloon, by contrast, was a pleasure to look up into. We'd seen to that, Muted greys and browns for the most part contrasted with walnut and soft forgotten yellows. And so, while this man was thinking sullied, still there was an admixture of pleasurable cognition in his thinking, struggling with the original perception. Another man, on the other hand, might view the balloon as if it were part of a system of unanticipated rewards, as when one's employer walks in and says, Here, Henry, take this package of money I have wrapped for you, because we have been doing so well in the business here, and I admire the way you bruise the tulips, without which bruising your department would not be a success, or at least not the success that it is. For this man, the balloon might be a brilliantly heroic muscle and pluck experience, even if an experience poorly understood. Another man might say, without the example of blank, it is doubtful that blank would exist today in its present form, and find many to agree with him, or to argue with him. Ideas of bloat and float were introduced, as well as concepts of dream and responsibility. Others engaged in remarkably detailed fantasies having to do with a wish either to lose themselves in the balloon or to engorge it. The private character of these wishes, of their origins, deeply buried and unknown, was such that they were not much spoken of. Yet, there's evidence that they were widespread. It was also argued that what was important was what you felt when you stood under the balloon. Some people claimed that they felt sheltered, warmed as never before, while enemies of the balloon felt a reported feeling constrained, a heavy feeling. Critical opinion was divided. Monstrous pourings, harp, certain contrasts with darker portions, inner joy, large square corners. Conservative eclecticism that has so far governed modern balloon design, abnormal vigor, warm, soft, lazy passages. Has unity been sacrificed for a sprawling quality? Quelle catastrophe! Munching! People began, in a curious way, to locate themselves in relation to aspects of the balloon, albeit that place where it dips into 47th Street, almost to the sidewalk near the Alamo Chile house. Or, why don't we go stand on top and take the air and maybe walk about a bit, where it forms a tight, curving line with the facade of the Gallery of Modern Art? Marginal intersections offered entrances within a given time duration, as well as warm, soft, lazy passages in which... But it's wrong to speak of marginal intersections. Each intersection was crucial, none could be ignored, as if, walking there, you might not find someone capable of turning your attention in a flash from old exercises to new exercises. Each intersection was crucial, meeting of balloon and building, meeting of balloon and man, meeting of balloon and balloon. 
It was suggested that what was admired about the balloon was finally this, that it was not limited or defined. Sometimes a bulge, blister, or subsection would carry all the way east to the river on its own initiative in the manner of an army's movements on a map as seen in a headquarters remote from the fighting. Then that part would be, as it were, thrown back again or would withdraw into new dispositions the next morning that part would have made another sortie or disappeared altogether. This ability on the part of the balloon to shift its shape, to change, was very pleasing, especially to people whose lives were rather rigidly patterned, persons to whom change, although desired, was not available. The balloon, for the 22 days of its existence, offered the possibility, in its randomness, of getting lost, of losing oneself, in contradistinction to the grid of precise rectangular pathways under our feet. The amount of specialized training currently needed and the consequent desirability of long-term commitments has been occasioned by the steadily growing importance of complex machinery in virtually all kinds of operations, and as this tendency increases, more and more people will turn in bewildered inadequacy to solutions for which the balloon may stand as a prototype or rough draft. I met you under the balloon on the occasion of your return from Norway. You asked if it was mine. I said it was. The balloon, I said, is a spontaneous autobiographical disclosure having to do with the unease I felt at your absence and with sexual deprivation. But now that your visit to Bergen has been terminated, it is no longer necessary or appropriate. Removal of the balloon was easy. Trailer trucks carried away the depleted fabric, which is now stored in West Virginia, awaiting some other time of unhappiness, some time perhaps when we're angry with one another. <laughs>